It's a 24 seven, almost 365 job because as an interventional cardiologist, if someone is having a heart attack at 2 a.m., okay, chest pain, they call 911, they get rushed to the hospital, the patient is seen in the emergency room, we do an EKG, the EKG shows that this patient is having a heart attack, I'm getting called to come in, right? At the drop of a hat, stop what you're doing, come into the hospital and save this person's life. And then we quickly rush this patient to the heart catheterization lab, and we prep the patient and get the patient on the table to get that artery open and restore blood flow to the heart. Welcome to Show Your Receipts, where we believe if you can see it, you can be it. Receipts are evidence or proof that something has occurred. Our guests are evidence that Black excellence is alive and well. They will be sharing their receipts on how they've been able to accomplish so much in their life. I'm your host, Tony Jackson. Let's get started. Welcome to Show Your Receipts, where we believe if you can see it, you can be it. I am super excited to talk to our guest today. Uh, our guest, Dr. Uh, Edward Wingfield, jo- uh, I'm going to read a little bit of his bio. Our uh, guest, Dr. Edward Wingfield, joined Hamilton Cardiology Associates in July 2010, uh, a graduate of Temple University School of Medicine. He completed his internal medicine internship and residency at New York Presbyterian Hospital. Will Cornell Medical Center and general cardiology training at cardiovascular disease at Drexel University College of Medicine, Hanneman uh, University Hospital, where he also served as chief cardiologist fellow. He returned to New York Presbyterian Hospital for interventional cardiology training. Dr. Wingfield helped establish the Hamilton Cardiology Associates AIAC accreditation vascular ultrasound lab and has been the medical director since 2011. In addition, to that St. Francis Medical Center Vascular Lab, where he had been the medical director from 2016 to 2022. Dr. Wingfield is board certified in cardiology diseases, interventional cardiology, endovascular medicine, and is a registered physician at in vascular interpretation. In addition, he completed level two training in nuclear cardiology, echocardio- echocardiography, and transcephal echocardiology. Uh, It's clear I'm not a doctor. His areas of focus include interventional cardiology and peripheral vascular disease. Dr. Winfield is is the current president of the medical staff, director of cardiac cath lab, chairman of the PCI task force, and serves as a member of the medical executive committee, the credentialing committee, medicine peer review, Medical Quality Council and Utilization Review at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital, Hamilton. He was previously the chairman of the Department of Cardiology and secretary treasurer at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital in Hamilton. He is also the former medical director of the Vascular Lab, former member of Utilization Management, and previously served on the Pharmacy and uh, Therapeutics Committee at St. Francis Medical Center. He is a Morehouse man, a father, a husband, a leader, and we have him here today. Welcome to the podcast, my brother. Hey, Tony, thank you so much. Thank you. Wow, what an introduction. <laughs> I'm hey, really going to wait here. I'm like, who is he talking about? But okay, <laughs> thank you. I appreciate that. And I had to cut out some of the stuff. And I do apologize. I'm definitely not a doctor. I've seen some of the words. I'm like, ooh, I got to read that one right there. But it's just impressive to read your resume let alone to know that you were able to accomplish it. And so I'm going to jump right into it. And so as a cardiologist, for those of us out there who are not too familiar with medical medical specialties, can you tell me what a cardiologist does on a day-to-day basis? Well, I think I'll start with heart disease because that's what we do. We treat heart disease. Heart disease is the number one killer in this country and throughout the world. And heart disease has been the number one killer since they started recording those numbers back in 1900. Mm-hmm. Every 34 seconds, someone suffers a heart attack, and every 84 seconds, someone dies of a heart attack. So in terms of what I do, it's very busy. I treat all facets or all phases of heart disease. I, I'm an educator. I educate my patients on diabetes and cholesterol and how to live and eat healthy, how to exercise properly. And I also treat the end stages of heart disease, which are blockages in the heart arteries that lead to heart attacks. 
So on a day-to-day basis, I do procedures called angioplasty. And when you do an angioplasty, that's where you enter through either the radial artery in the wrist or through the groin. And you actually go in and use tiny balloons to open up the arteries to restore blood flow uh, to the heart or other organs, the carotid arteries in the neck and also the arteries in the lower extremities. So it is definitely hands-on, but there's education involved and uh, a lot of stress. But it is, for me, something I've wanted to do for quite some time. It is my dream job. I grew up wanting to be a cardiologist. That's my day-to-day office, treating, educating, and intervening on patients. That's incredible. And so talk to me about the skill set that's required to be a doctor. Do you just have to be a person who loves the human body? Is it something that was a person who just loves science? Is it more about the desire and love and passion to be able to help people? Talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, that's a great, great question. I think you touched on a lot of it. One is is that you have to be driven to to help people because that is is first and foremost why you're doing what you're doing to change lives and you start to see the impact that you have on people not only the the, the patient that you touch but also the the family the family members and the friends and those who are associated with your particular patient so the things that are are certainly required is compassion. It's drive, it's grit, it's determination. It is certainly a long road to become a physician, let alone to be a, a super sub special, super sub specialist when you become a, a, an interventional cardiologist. The road to becoming that physician, it, it, it's a long road. So you have to have the, the perseverance, the, the love for science, the love for people. You have to be a good communicator. You have to be a good speaker. And you really have to be passionate about what you're doing. Okay. So just to dive into what you just said, you mentioned the long road to becoming a doctor. I got a chance to see that front row. My college sweetheart is also a dermatologist. She's a dermatologist. And she's a mole surgeon. So I got a kind of chance to see that front row seat and her becoming and accomplishing her goal. What is it that separates the people who had that long-term vision? Because it's a very long road. I mean, you said it's a long road. It's a very long road. And I think even for you being a cardiologist, probably, I think it was even longer than what my wife did. Uh, do you feel like you were wired to be a, a person who could delay their gratification and, and, and put a goal out there long term and keep working for it? Or uh, is this something, Is have you always been this way where you had a long term vision and, and willing to put things aside and work, and work hard for it? Yes, yeah, that's funny because I'll be honest. I didn't know the road was this long, right? I, I didn't realize that, that what was involved in, my thought was I want to go to medical school, right? I want to be a doctor. Mm. But I didn't come from a family where we had physicians and my dad was a, a doctor, my mom or my, so I really didn't have an understanding of what four years of medical school was and, and three years of residency and then applying for a uh, cardiology fellowship and then applying for an interventional fellowship and doing the training and all that that's involved. My thought was, look, I want to be a doctor. And I, I was always driven in that manner. And once you start on a road like that, obviously, then you, you want to see it through completion. So to see it through was my objective. Looking back, now, if I had to do it all again, I'd probably still do it. But, but I went in just point A to point B, point B to point C and made it from that standpoint and becoming and, and really just being passionate about it. And it was really, I was wired for science. I really thought that that was my driving force. And then once I got my hands on the heart and, and cardiology, it was like, it, it, it's cardiology or nothing. That was, that, that was it. That's amazing. What does a typical day look like for a cardiologist? Is this something, are you doing surgeries all the time? Or are you doing a lot of clinical work where you're sitting down with patients and giving them uh, uh, advice on how to get healthier? Uh, what does that look like? Is it a lot of ER uh, time, a lot of clinical time? How was that divided up? Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's a 24-7, almost 365 job because as an interventional cardiologist, if someone is having a heart attack at 2 a.m., okay, chest pain, 
They call 911, they get rushed to the hospital. The patient is seen in the emergency room. We do an EKG. The EKG shows that this patient is having a heart attack. I'm getting called to come in, right? At the drop of a hat, stop what you're doing, come into the hospital and save this person's life. And then we quickly rush this patient to the heart catheterization lab and we prep the patient and get the patient on the table to get that artery open and restore blood flow to the heart. So it is it is a, a around the clock, and that's one aspect where I may get called in at 2 a.m., but then again at 8 a.m., I'm in the office seeing patients, right? And I may see 20, 30, 40 patients in a day in the office uh, and, and counsel them on heart disease, on their blood pressure, make changes to their medications, educate them about their blood sugars, how to exercise. So that may be a typical office day which I, I typically, I'm in the office uh, a couple of days a week. The other days, I'm actually doing procedures, okay? And uh, those procedures can range from opening up blockages in the lower extremities and the heart. So it is definitely hands-on. Some people say, is it surgery? Not quite surgery. The way that medicine is going today, we can do a whole lot more without actually opening the chest or opening the leg. We can use small catheters and wires to to get from one point to the next to open up open up arteries. And what, what we're talking about opening up, we're talking about this cholesterol that builds up in the arteries. And then I also have an aspect of my, my, my job where I am in, in a hospital administrator. I'm the president of medical staff, so I oversee about 450 physicians wow. and uh, interact with the leadership of the hospital to improve hospital metrics, hospital outcomes, patient satisfaction, as well as physician satisfaction. It's a very busy day to day, but I'll I'll be honest, I love what I do. Dr. Wick, but it actually brings me to my next question. You set me up perfectly. Work-life balance is a major topic of discussion this day and age. You hear a lot of people talking about how they strike a balance between work and family and all these different things. You are the poster child for high achievement. And me having a little bit of uh, experience being around doctors, I understand that when you talk about doctors, there's levels, right? And to be a cardiologist, that's at the top of the top where you start talking about the respect that you guys get. And then also you're literally saving lives. But on top of that, it's almost like for fun, you have a whole nother responsibility where you're an administrator and you're managing all of these people. How do you... Uh, achieve at such a high level and still strike a, a, a balance where it works for you in your overall life and family and health and mentals and all that stuff. Yeah, you, you really have to be geared to do it. I always live by that most people are doing this. Uh, I'm the only one doing this mm. because you are essentially working pretty much around the clock. You have uh, patients' lives in your hands uh, when you're doing a procedure. It, it doesn't end when you get home. You, you get calls throughout the night. You want to make sure that your patient is doing well. So it is, there, there's a lot of stress that goes along with it. So as I said, you really have to be geared to do it. It's difficult to be a cardiologist and really have a, a work-life balance and really be good at what you do. Because as I said, heart disease, it is the number one killer. And the volume or the number of patients, especially as you build your practice and word of mouth gets out and patients want to see you. And every patient should feel like they're your only patient. You should really put that patient first and, and, and foremost and really treat them as they are a family member. And that's how you become and, and, and you are a, a good physician. But at the same time, you, you have to figure out how to exercise, how to work out, how to relieve stress, how to be there for your family, how to be a good husband, be a good father at the same time. So you don't sleep a whole lot. Right? So so if, if you like to sleep, nah, this is not, uh, you're not going to be good at this. I'm going to tell you, right? Sleep is, is, is not part of the, uh, I guess, the, the job description when you, when, yeah. when you want to be an interventional cardiologist, right? You really just have to be geared to it. You, you have to put everything first, family, work, patients. And that's my philosophy. Now, there are other people who can do it in a different way, but I really think you just have to 
you just go all out in, in every aspect of it. Let me ask you an interesting question. Somebody just thought about it because you mentioned the fact that you're getting phone calls at night. You're getting but heart disease is the number one killer. I have a two part question. First part question is, are those numbers getting better where heart disease is becoming less deadly? People are getting healthier. Is that happening over time? And the second part to that question is, if not, and even if so, if you could wave a magic wand and almost force people to do the things that will prevent them from needing to be sitting in, in your office, in your exam room, what are some of the things that people need to be doing or people need to stop doing? Right. Okay. So the first part of that question, what's going on with the numbers, right? So heart disease, we talked about it's the number one killer, but yeah, we are making significant headway and those numbers were coming down in terms of heart disease mortality, but still it's the number one killer. But if you look at how we eat our diet, the portions that we eat, right? We eat out a lot. Nobody has time to cook so much salt in the diet, so many carbs, all those things are really sending us in the wrong direction. So heart disease, although we we have more capability of treating it, we do see that there are some significant disparities in healthcare that predispose certain groups to having more heart disease. So as we see heart disease numbers coming down in some aspects, other communities, it is it's definitely going up. So yeah, there's education, there's increasing awareness, there are modes and methods to try and, you know, move the needle in, in, in the other direction to, to, to lower the incidence of heart disease. But we, we talk about how I think COVID, when COVID came and COVID hit, we really saw how certain communities were disproportionately affected because of mm. other comorbidities. It's the same with heart disease. If you have other comorbidities, heart disease is going to impact you in a way that is is out of proportion to, to someone else who doesn't have those comorbidities. That's one thing. As you begin to treat heart disease, you start to say that, wow, I'm as an interventional cardiologist, I'm on the back end, right? I'm here when a guy has a heart attack. I should be here mm. before. I should be talking to this family beforehand. And I'll just give you a, a, a funny story, something that I see quite often. A patient comes into the heart the, to the hospital with a heart attack and 100 percent blockage, shock, whatever. The patient's crashing and we turn the patient around, open up the artery, fix the artery. Patient is doing well. We get him back up to his room. Family is there waiting for him. And the family has you know, a box of Popeyes or a bag of, of, of burgers or whatever from McDonald's. And that's what they're bringing into the hospital. Now, mind you, this guy just had a heart attack, right? And the whole room smells like fried chicken or, or McDonald's. So it's, it's one of those things where you really have to get on the front end as opposed to treating the back end. So that education about making different food choices and, and how to eat healthy and how to exercise, those are the conversations that as I uh, continue in my path as a cardiologist, I'm doing more and more of that as opposed to trying to treat it once the arteries are clogged and you need quadruple bypass surgery. Yeah. And, and man, you just raised the, you just raised the great point, Dr. Wink. But how do we, as the black community, how do we get past that, right? Because I grew up, I still think of a lot of my older people in my family, aunts and uncles, like, let's say they don't see me for a while and I'm working out and they see me, they'll say, boy, you need to eat. You need to put some meat. I'm thinking, I, I see, I went from 260 to 245. Like, I'm still okay. I'm all right. But the idea of even losing any kind of weight or getting sweats, it's like, it's some things in our community. It's some thought processes. It's some mentalities that continue to hold us back and, and continue to drive us down that path where we're sitting in somebody's chair like you. Talk to me about that. Do you have any thoughts on how we can remedy this or, or what are your thoughts on that? Right. It, it, it's, it's tough because we all grow up and we in our, our palate, we are geared in terms of how we eat to 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 eat a certain food. And, and that food brings us warmth and closeness and family. And it's just it, it's so intertwined in us that 
when family's here, we're going to eat. So we really have to start making different choices when it comes to how we eat. You can't, the way I ate when I was 25, I'm 51. I can't eat. I, I can't continue in, in that manner. So we really have to make some mindful choices in, in how we eat and in how we prepare our foods. There are many ways to prepare foods in, in a way that, that you still get the same gratification and the, the, the same taste without raising your blood pressure 20 or 30 points or, or raising your cholesterol. Right. So we, we can't fry everything. We can't fry chicken and we can't fry this and, and we can't add so much salt and, and the things like that and cook in a certain way. But we just have to be mindful about how we eat and, and understand that we really have to make some serious choices. Because when we look at African-Americans, we are tend to be more sensitive to salt. Right. Salt has a bigger mm-hmm. impact on our blood pressure than other races. And in a lot of cases, we will. You see people, they grabbing a hot sauce before they taste the food or they grabbing the salt before they even taste the food. You can't taste the food first, right? We season it. We all season. Black black people, (laughs) we season the food, right? So, And we we, we emphasize, you taste that, right? But a lot of times we're adding to it prior to even even tasting it. So there are some things that we can do to to become more conscious of our health and, and, and make some changes in our diet. Thank you for that info. That was definitely a lot of what you just said was for me. I'll be sending you a copay. Uh, thank you for that. <laughs> Let's kind of switch gears here and talk about uh, you becoming who you are because people s- s- sit down and they look at you and you're this finished product, very polished, very accomplished, very insightful. Uh, but obviously it was a process for you to get to where you are today. The question I have for you is what do I need to understand about you and your earliest years? to understand the man that you are today and who, and who you become today. Wow. Yeah, I always say that we're standing on the shoulders of our family members, our forefathers. And I I, I really held my my grandparents, especially my grandfathers, at a, at a really high, high standard. Not so much standard, but I, I was just so thoroughly impressed at their upbringing as uh, the men that they were. And even in, in fact, in going to my dad and the man that he is, those things really drove me to really to win and to compete and to accomplish things that I felt that they weren't able to. I was always inspired. Some of the things my grandfather told me, he emphasized reading. It was it's just a couple of words that they may say to you throughout the years that, that just stick. And we all have that where we get a word here or a word there for some reason. It, it sticks to you. But but I, w- I was always inspired and just felt like I had and just carried the baton to another level to to reach goals that, that they thought about and may not have been able to go to school or to get access to the things that I did. So I really, as I said, just held my, my parents, my grandparents up to, I really just put them on a, on a pedestal and felt like I had to achieve because of them. And they really uh, dr- drove me and inspired me I was always sports driven. I was extremely athletic, could play basketball, football, and and that was what got me to Morehouse College. Was football? I got a full ride football scholarship to go to Morehouse, mm. and, and I remember telling my grandparents who were from Georgia that I was going to Morehouse, and pretty much what they knew about Morehouse was preachers. They was like, "Oh, you're gonna be a preacher?" <laughs> I was like, "I'm not gonna be a preacher." You know, at the game. Yeah, yeah, it would be Dr. Kate going to Morehouse. But going to Morehouse, I really felt was the best, right? The top of the food chain, being the best. If I'm going to go to a school, I want to go to the school that that I hold in the highest esteem. And the same being a cardiologist. I felt that cardiology was the highest of all highs when it comes to a physician. So I wanted to achieve greatness and, and, and really be the best. So dealing with challenges throughout the way, because as I said, I didn't know the path of becoming a doctor. So it was trial and error. It was passing this class and failing that one, repeating this one, going to a post back. So it was a long journey to to get there. I became a school teacher. I, sco- I taught school for three years in between Morehouse and going to medical school. I've always kept ties with the community for sure. I, I definitely, I always want to have one hand in the community as I lift, as we say, lifting as we climb. 
to stay, mm-hmm. stay connected with the young people as much as I possibly can. Your story is very interesting because here you are, this co- accomplished physician, but you also have this athletic background, which is not typical, right? It's not typical for somebody to be this great athlete and, and go, you go to college and talk to me about why you never limited your accomplishment to just sports. Because a lot of times when a person has a lot of skills and a lot of ability in sports and they have a lot of accomplishments, sports become everything. But it seems like even when you were picking your college, you saw past sports, you saw bigger than just your athletic ability and you were thinking further down the road. Did this come from your grandparents? Did this come from your parents? Where did you get this? Where did you get this mindset from? Yeah, it is for sure something that was instilled as, as for my parents. So sports, although we love to play, that wasn't, it really wasn't impressing my mom and dad, right? They said, look, I remember having a conversation with my dad. I was taking an AP biology class in senior year. I signed up for a class. It was AP bio class. I was like, eh. You know, everybody else was getting out of school at like one thirty, and I was in the AP class until like three thirty. Then had to go to football practice, so <laughs> I was having a conversation with my dad. Like, I think I'm gonna drop this already. I'm good. I'm going to I got my college. I got this and that. And he was like, oh, "You want to drop that class, but why don't you drop football?" I was like, "So it was always the importance. It wasn't so much in the athletics, although you know, for me, that was pretty much everything. That kept it all in perspective to say that." your education is first and foremost, right? So you don't sacrifice your education or limit yourself or limit your education. Then that goes to what my grandfather said. I'm sitting there watching TV or something like that. And my grandfather was like, get all the education that you can get, right? He said that I'm maybe like 10, 11 years old, but it just stuck with me. So I I knew that it, it was extremely important to excel in the classroom and understand the importance of that education and take advantage of that opportunity that I have. And I did that way as a school teacher. That was my message. If you were in Mr. Wingfield's class, you knew this Mr. Wingfield was talking about taking advantage of this opportunity that you have to educate yourself and learn as much as you possibly can. You only have X amount. You only got 50 minutes in this classroom, right? And you got other kids in other schools taking advantage of their 50 minutes. You need to Focus on your education and, and do that. So those are the things that spilled over. I knew that that education was going to take me uh, much farther than football. You just use it to get from point A to point B, knowing that that read as much as you can, learn as much as you can, speak as much as you can, put yourself in awkward situations as much as you possibly can so that you can become comfortable in front of people speaking and articulating in such a way that, that you move people. And then you you show yourself as a leader. And just to piggyback off of that AP class experience, that uh, AP biology class experience, clearly you were already taking some science classes. And and that's what maybe gave you the confidence to take the AP biology class and then set you up as you went into uh, Morehouse. Talk to me about the importance of math and science, because if you had maybe decided your senior year that you wanted to have a focus on these math and science classes, Maybe things turn out differently for you. You don't have if you don't have that foundation that you're taking in high school and then going into college. How important is uh, STEM in this economy today? How important is it for a young people or anybody to be proficient in some of these things? Yeah, STEM. It you know the the thing about math and science, you are always thinking and and inventing. Every day, so that is is something that that math and science really bring. It causes you to to think deeply. It cause it, it it forces you to question. It's just about everything you see or you you hear. So science and math intertwine. It is it it just like we say when it comes to sports that, that football is like a microcosm of life, and what you learn on a football field is so relatable to life. Mm-hmm. But but when we talk about science and designing experiments and proving proving facts or no or not facts, right? But but you really have to be that type of person to to question, to answer, to formulate an opinion, to make calculations. So I, I, I really push the the STEM 
of course, reading and, and English and those things are, are super important. But the way that that science plays such a role in every aspect of, of our lives that it, and it is amazing. It's, it's wonderful. I was a science teacher and I would try to blow something up or really impress the kids with a project so that they could you could really draw them in and just stimulate their interest. Because nowadays, all it takes is an idea. You have the ability to do just about anything as long as you just have the idea. So having that science background, having that background to question, to answer, to to formulate, it's really important. And it's a skill that a lot of us really should further develop. I want to talk, I want to chat with you a little bit about Morehouse. I got a confession to make, Dr. Wingfield. I am, I'm jealous of you. My undergraduate, I went to University of Iowa and I grew up watching a different world and I just watched, you know, Drumline. I watched all these different things and I have all these visions of the HBCU experience and how it never ends. You could be 45 and still go back to homecoming and, and, and the community and all of that. It's like, I'm jealous of that. Could you share with me what your experience was like at Morehouse, having black professors and, and black president of the university and, and academic excellence was expected of you and you're being taught by people who have similar backgrounds and all share with me that experience what was that like for you to start it's it's empowering it is definitely empowering and as i said i'm one who i stand on the shoulders of so many before me and when you go to an hbcu you see the history you see those who went before you and you feel that obligation that and not only the obligation to succeed and excel but you really feel that that you owe mm. them, you owe yourself to to be great. And you just seeing those professors sitting in those classrooms and, and hearing it from someone who looks like you, it's an unbelievable feeling. And then to be at, at Morehouse, which is, we talk about Black excellence and, and Morehouse College, the mystique of Morehouse, the history of Morehouse, those who've been at Morehouse, it's just different. It's a special place. And coming from there, you always have that 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 chip on your shoulder to say, "A Morehouse, right?" So it's different. And I I know people who went to other universities and don't really have that HBCU pedigree, but but yeah, it, it's home for life. Obviously, you have the home come as and as a member of Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated, greatest fraternity in the world. You have that, and it's a storybook. Right. To, to play on the football team at Morehouse, to play against Tuskegee and Howard and Hampton and the Fort Valley states and then experience the homecomings and the Freakniks and, and all of that. That was HBCU and pledge and have that whole process. It's amazing. It's amazing. People write books about it, but actually to live it and to experience it, it, it is something special. But all of that really pushes you every single day to excel and, and be great and be fearless and to walk into a room and expect to uh, to make a difference and expect to uh, to have that seat at the table. And if it's not there, to make that seat at the table. You watch the, the, those who came before us, what they went through with the civil rights movements. And, and, mm -hmm. and it's, it's just amazing that we had it so easy. Although we dealt with turbulent times while we were there, what they went through was just far above what what we've had to experience and we owe everything we have to those who came before us that is amazing so you have truly had a full college experience i mean you had the social aspect of going to a, a b historically hbcu i love how you slid in there being a part of what you said the best fraternity in the world. Let's chat about that for a second. Uh -huh. Talk to me about Greek life because again, when I talk about being jealous, like I went to University of Iowa. Greek life was almost non-existent. We had a little sprinkle something, but it was not, it was non-existent. Talk to me about what inspired you, motivated you to want to pledge. What made you want to pledge uh, Omega Sci-Fi? Omega Sci and what is it that people don't know about? Because I think that sometimes the stereotype is the people are fraternity. They're the cool kids on campus and they throw parties and they have fun. 
But I know a lot of what fraternities stand for is about outreach, is about academics, and it's also about post-grad networking and collaborating. So talk to me about the impact of the greatest fraternity in the world has had on your life. Yeah, and, and that's been my mantra since I can remember, right? Go to the, the, the best high school, go to the best college, pledge the best, the greatest fraternity, be an interventional cardiologist, which is at the top. When it comes to to Omega, it's different. It's it's different. There, there's no fraternity like it. And uh, we talk about the networking, but it's friendship is essential to the soul. So mm-hmm. it, it, it it's friendship, it's fraternity, it's service, it's being out, but it's also being able to be up early in the morning, giving mm-hmm. back to your community, serving your community, uplifting young people. So there, there's a lot to it beyond the purple and gold. But so it's uh, and, and it's a lifelong thing. So you always have that behind you as you step into the community, as you inspire young people. Right. So you always have that. Obviously, you're never alone. So it's great when you're undergrad and you're on the yard and you're on campus, and, but you're still working. It's still service, right? You're still working. Yeah. And once you're out, you still have that 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 network and that that greatness. And when I went to college, I, I had no knowledge of, of fraternities. I think school days, and that's way before your time, but that was about it. Like I said, in terms when it comes to my family members who went to college, nobody had pledged or nobody, it was, we didn't have, doc, I got to campus. I didn't know a fraternity from whatever, you know what I mean? It mm-hmm. was just, I just showed up and I was like, yo, who them dudes? Who those? Okay. And I was on the football team, so I was good. But mm-hmm. uh, so it, it, it was a great time, but it continues and it's a life thing. That is, that is awesome. So the question I have for you is a lot of times belief is what holds a lot of people back. I, I feel like I would have probably did more things on the academic end of things earlier in life if I had, that belief in myself. I, I always initially had a lot of belief in my athletic ability and the belief in my academic ability didn't come until, until later on. And the question I have for you is to go to college to play football, but also to have this dream to be a doctor is a huge dream. Listen, I played on a football team. Now one person became a doctor on my football team. Now one person playing to be a doctor was taking those kind of classes. Zero out of 120 guys. And so it is a very, very rare thing to be a student athlete, but also have this longer term goal to become an individual, individual cardiologist with some would argue, I would potentially argue is just as big or if not bigger than having a dream to go to the NFL because it's a lot more rare. What pivotal moment or experience gave you the personal belief to say, you know what? Not only do I want to become a doctor, but I believe that I can actually do it. Like, cause I, and I'm saying all this because I remember the moment where I truly believed that I could play the NFL. I remember I was sitting in my girlfriend's dorm room, who's my wife now, and we're watching the draft. And it's a guy, I'm not going to say his name, but it's a guy who got drafted. And I said, oh, if he got drafted, <laughs> I already know. It's a done deal. You could put it on the calendar 12 months from now. I'll get drafted because I saw this guy get drafted. Did you have one of those moments where it was like, it just hit you like, all right, not only can I do this, but I know it's going to happen. Yeah, it's a series of things. For one, for sure, I got to a point where there was no plan B. This was it. Mm. So yeah, I, I got to the point where there was no plan B. This, this was it, right? So I always had that drive that it's going to work out. No matter what, what's going on, it's going to work out. If this is what you want, it's gonna, you're going to have it. This is going to work out. So, so when I said, look, I got to sit down. I got to study for the MCATs. I said, look, I can't. I'm, I'm done. I'm not working out. I'm just here. I'm locked in. I'm going to study. I'm going to get, I'm going to get this done. So I just basically told myself that there's no alternative. Now I did become a school teacher and, and, and taught, but I knew when I was preparing lesson plans for my kids, I was actually, I'm studying for the MCAT. I'm preparing for the MCAT. It was undergrad. I really only just operated with that belief that, look, I'm going to medical school. And that was it. Was I the greatest student? I was playing football. I was pledging. I was, so it wasn't like I was a 4.0 student. 
But what I was able to do was understand the process. I actually mm. set up my own interviews with uh, Elijah Saunders, who was a big time at University of Maryland School of Medicine. He was a, a black uh, hypertensive specialist who was part of the faculty at the University of Maryland. So I reached out to him. I had graduated. I had decent grades. I was becoming a, a school teacher, but I knew I wanted to go to med school. And so I reached out to a Dr. Saunders and he awarded me an interview. I sat down, we talked, and I said, what do I need to do to get into medical school? And that became my sole focus. I met with one of the deans at, at Howard University School of Medicine, we sat down, had a conversation, and I built a, a plan to get into medical school. And I went down the road of doing a post back program, which is a, a post baccalaureate program, which is after you've graduated. Well, you had decent grades. You, you got to have good grades just to get into a post back program, but your grades aren't good enough for medical school. So I got into one of the best post back programs, which was called Med Prep. Med Prep is in Carbondale, Illinois. So I went out to Carbondale, Illinois, drove out there in a little Hyundai. I don't know how many nights, I don't know how many hours from DC to Carbondale, Illinois. I had a one one room studio apartment, no bed, no couch, nothing. Just mm. a pillow and a blanket on the floor. I had a kitchen mm. and I was locked in. That was it. I went to class. I studied. It was only the only thing that was going to limit me was myself. Right. Mm. And I knew. And I, I roughly right before that, I got married. So uh, I was like 25 years old out there in Carbondale, Illinois, sleeping on the floor, doing nothing but grinding and studying and preparing for the MCAT. After that, aced everything, did the MCAT, did relatively well on the MCAT. But it was, like they say, Super Bowl or bus. <laughs> it was medical school or bus. That was the wow. only thing that I was even thinking about. So that really changed my mindset. I interacted with another mentor at, at Boston University. I did a summer program right right before graduation. I did a summer program at Boston University. And one of the, the professors at that summer program, and it was geared for African-American students who wanted to go to med school. And what he told us, and he, he told us that, look, when you, being a black student in medical school or being a black doctor, right, you are going to be expected to be as sharp on day one, hour one, as you are on hour 46, 47, okay? Because when you take, when you're on call, you come in, you're nice and fresh, right? When you come in at the beginning of the day, you're going to be up all night. You're going to be doing admissions. You're going you're gonna to be up, not get any sleep. You're going to be sitting there in morning report, presenting your cases and presenting and answering questions about your admission. And your, the expectation is that you're as sharp then as you were when you first walked in the door. So mm. that said to me that, dude, I got to bust my butt. I got to study. I got to be sharp. I got to take this serious. And just those conversations along the way really put into perspective what I really had to do and how I had to be locked in to, to achieve what I want. And I say this is my, my dream job. I lost my, my grandfather because I wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon. I thought I wanted to be a, a, a team physician, a team doctor for a football team, basketball team, and do ortho and, and, and surgery and stuff like that. But Super Bowl Sunday, uh, I think it was 90, 98. I believe it was Denver and Atlanta was playing, and uh, that was the day I lost my grandfather uh, suddenly to a heart attack. And it was right before I was going to start medical school. OK, six months before I was going to start medical school. And at the time when we got the death certificate on the death certificate, it said cause of death, atherosclerosis. And I'm sitting there looking at atherosclerosis, which is coronary artery disease. OK, so plaque in the heart arteries. And he unfortunately he passed away from a heart attack. That really changed my focus in terms of why I was going to medical school and what I wanted to treat. So once I got to medical school, you do gross anatomy. Gross anatomy is where you dissect the entire, you have a cadaver, okay? So you dissect the entire body. And mm -hmm. when we got to the heart and doing the dissection of the heart and looking at the arteries and looking at the muscles and the heart valves and all those things, it just clicked. It mm -hmm. just made so much sense to me. And from then on, I knew that I was going to be a cardiologist. So getting, long story, getting back to your point of when I knew 
that's when I knew my first year of medical school, when we did the, the dissection of the, the heart, I knew for sure that was what I was born to do. Wow. Wow. Man, you have an incredible story. Just listening to the perseverance that you had to go through, the driving out to Illinois, the, and it seems like mentors played a big role in giving you direction, giving you guidance, giving you coaching along the way. Talk to me about the value of mentorship and how it helped you become who you are today. And are you still in the process of uh, being mentored or mentoring other people? Oh, yeah. The value of mentorship is so important to expose young people to things that they would never get even a glimpse of, whether it is having a, a, a student who's interested in medicine come to the hospital and just stand in the control room and watch me do procedures or have them come into the procedure room and actually see me operate. It just shows them that you can actually do this. So that's one of the things I'm involved with reading to elementary kids. Anytime I have an opportunity to go to the classroom or to meet with kids and, and, and talk to kids and ask them, what do you want to be when you grow up? How are you going to be accomplish that? What else could you be? If you're not that, what else are you, can you do? So I really enjoy that. And like I said, try to stay tied in whatever way I can to the community. But we really need mentors. I really <laughs> saw the importance. I grew up with strong role models. But there's so many kids who don't have that strong role model. And when I was teaching, I was one of the teachers where some of the kids would have my phone number. They could call me or page me or whatever. And the kids would come to my neighborhood to play on the basketball court. And when I was teaching, I'm like 22, 23 years old. My kids are 13, 14 years old. So it was a direct connection. But to serve as a mentor when I was so close in age, that they really just looked up to me and could really open up and talk. And you can really see what some of these kids are are dealing with on a daily basis and how you can really inspire them to study, to read, and just open doors that, that really would not be there. So I, I really value mentorship. I wish I had more time to, to be in the community and be uh, around kids. But any opportunity I get, I try to take advantage of. Absolutely, absolutely. You mentioned you were 23 mentoring the kids 13, I would have been that 13 year old. So yeah. just listening to you right now, you are so impressive. Just listening to your story, what you've been able to accomplish. And then you and your wife being this power couple, you guys are like the modern day Huxtables, just seeing what you guys have done and the life that you've created. Talk to me about as a mentor, do you see, do you believe that in this day and age, there are less mentors than when you were young and up and coming? Do you think that numbers, those numbers are declining? Do you think that you, do you have any idea on the need for, or do you feel like there's a pressing need for more mentors out there? Yeah, there is. You talk about work, work, life balance and time, and it does make it ex extremely difficult, especially when you're in a highly demanding field that where you always have to be sharp, right? So you really have to really make time for it. So it has to be something that's genuine in you that, look, this is, I have an obligation to give back. But really when you start to see that the difference that you can make and the difference in the kids' lives, it, it does really uh, push you to do more of it. But time is definitely one of the restraints. But, but being involved in Omega Sci-Fi, having relationships with pastors of different churches also allows you to have entry ways into the community and to, to deal with people. As a physician, I have a really close relationship with a lot of my patients who have youth outreach programs, community centers, churches, you name it. So you're always connected. There are certain professions that, that you're always tied to the community. So you, you can never get away. Absolutely. Absolutely. We're wrapping up here. I got a, a couple more questions. What, if you had to go back and give some advice to the 18 year old, the kid getting ready to head down to Atlanta, you got football guy, you, you headed to Atlanta, you next thing you know, you're pledging, you, you're doing all of these different things. What advice would you give sitting in the seat that you're sitting in now to your, to the 18 year old Edward? I would tell myself, do not limit your possibilities. Don't limit yourself. I really think that growing up, we were, it was a different mindset. 
it was a different, you had to do one, two, and three to get four, five, and six. There's so many different ways to see you. You're only limited by your imagination. You live once, right? And I, I feel that there's so many things that I, I could do. I mean, being an interventional cardiologist was great, but I think I could have really done well opening or starting up a private equity company or, or going into business or doing, you know, being one on the stock market or any of the number of things that, that, that interest me. So I would say just keep all your doors open. Be crazy about what the possibilities are. So don't limit yourself, especially at 18. So that's that would be my words of wisdom. Whatever you can imagine, you can accomplish. So go that route. Absolutely, absolutely. Dr. Wingfield, I want to thank you so much for taking your time to talk to me today. It was inspiring. It was insightful. It was educational. I hope that we can stay connected. I'll be maybe shooting you emails or bugging you because it's just it's, it's very rare to be able to to meet and connect with somebody at your level. You and your wife are just a, an amazing uh, dynamic duo. And so thank you so much for taking the time to, to speak with us today. Hey, Tony, I appreciate it. Thanks for thinking of me. Anytime I can be of service, please reach out. Uh, but this was excellent. So appreciate it. Thank you. And I uh, wish you the best. <laughs>